We've been going through this series in First Peter called Separated, and what does it mean to live separated? And you can't, you can't read First Peter and not talk about suffering or harassment or being targeted for your faith. It's, it's really kind of the predominant theme in First Peter. It really is. It's kind of the, the main thrust. And so today we're going to look at this idea of what does it mean? In fact, I think I t- call this targeted for truths when my faith is under fire. You were, so today, I, I hope you brought a Bible. I hope you always bring a Bible. And if you do, I hope you bring a pen and a piece of paper because I think God's going to say some things to you. And sometimes, by the way, you know, sometimes if you can learn to take notes, not, not just because I'm preaching, but if you can take notes on things, you know, you're going to be going through something at some point that it might help you figure some things out. And so these are some truths that I think when, because let me tell you, if you live in Christ and you walk openly in Christ, you are going to be targeted for your faith, whether it's at school, whether it's at the university, whether it's in the boardroom, whether you're in a sales meeting. It's not, I think sometimes we have this idea that persecution is this wide open, global, big, loud production. Let me tell you, harassment tends to happen more often than not in the one-on-one. It tends to happen when you're standing in front of HR and and they're saying, hey, you can't talk about those things. Or when you're standing there in a a, a meeting or maybe you're in the classroom and another student tells you and they're trying to silence you. Or maybe you're going at at a a, a, a lot of you are college. We've got college students coming back for the summer and maybe you're in some type of, of environment there on the campus where you're trying to be canceled or muted. It's not these often huge, loud productions. Often our faith Faith is targeted one-on-one. It's targeted in smaller environments. So, but it, it doesn't mean that it's any less severe. The more we go in Christ, the longer and the more this is going to happen. And so I'm going to, before we get to 1 Peter today, I want to walk you through why this happens before we talk about how to handle it. Because when it comes to being targeted for your faith or when your faith gets hard, do you think it's just because the world hates Christians? You know, I don't know. It's just because people like picking on us. That's not why. That's not why your faith is harassed. I want to set the stage, and it's going to get a little bit philosophical, and I've never claimed to be a philosopher, but I did go to college, so that must count for something, right? But but I, I, I'm going to walk you through, I think it helps to understand why Peter would say what he's saying. What's the context around why is our faith targeted? So I'm not a graphic designer, but I know Photoshop a little bit. So I, I played around with an image, and I want to show you that I'm going to go back, let's say, the American... When you think about, all I can talk about is the American culture because it's the only culture that I live in. But I would say, I, I was born in 1972. I went to high school in the 80s and went to college in the 90s. And I can say that if you look at the American landscape, I'm gonna use generic numbers, so I'm not claiming that these are locked in tight. But... For the better part of American history, truth, if that white box up there is American culture, there were things that Americans agreed upon for decades and decades and decades and decades. I'm going to use examples. Like, for instance, when I was growing up, even in my lifetime, and way before my lifetime, and and a lot of my adult life, nobody questioned Things like, does anatomy make you a man or a woman? And I know that's an easy target, but those were common, untouchable things that nobody debated, right? Nobody debated things like, should we even have a police force anymore? You can ask certain cities in America how that's going for them. Nobody questioned things like, What makes an American family a family? Can can, can it be a husband and a wife or can it be two men? 
And I'm not just picking on the LGBT community. I'm saying there were bedrock principles that, that really were off limits. They were off limits because they were, they were simply the truth. You started, you know, I grew up in an era, like we're in the era right now where there's this term that I hear, and this may, this may trigger some of you, but I don't know. Stick around, if it doesn't, stick around long enough. I mean, I'll trigger you at some point, you know. But this has been happening most of my lifetime. I grew up in an era where my, during deer season, my, my gun was in my vehicle, and the principals knew it, all of us. And we talked about going hunting after school. We never thought of shooting anybody. And now we hear terms like gun violence. That, that, that fascinates me truthfully because a gun's never killed anybody. People kill people. But you don't hear baseball bat violence or pocket knife violence. When it comes to DUIs, you don't hear things like Chevy violence. If you drive Chevys, which I hope you don't, but if you do... Right, But for so long, there were, there were certain, as my granddaddy might say, horse sense. Just common sense stuff, right? And, and when it comes to, to radical ideas like gender fluidity or radical ideas like, I mean, there's, there's a thousand we could pick from. Those ideas were kind of on the periphery for so long. For so long. And so there was order to society. There, there, was, there was common values. Even in political parties, there were common values. And so over time, those have eroded. Shocker. Even in my lifetime, it, I don't know if it, if it feels this way to you, but in my, it feels like our American culture is getting worse at an increasing pace. Right? And that's, that's safe to say. Morally, morally. We are questioning, we're, we're now, I mean, when I was growing up, even, even not even growing up 15 years ago, but when I was in high school, if we had had a situation in school where a dude was allowed to go into a girl's bathroom, he would have been arrested as a pedophile. Arrested. Now it's actually encouraged. So, so what happened? Like, what happened? And where does our faith fit into that? Well, the reason I point that out is because Peter talks about us being, what did I say in the first sermon? Strangers and aliens. The longer you go in Christ, you're going to feel like strangers and aliens. And so if you look, don't, don't turn there, but I want you to understand why. Before I get into this sermon about how to handle harassment for your faith, I want you to listen to the word of God coming from Paul. He talks about the Roman culture, and it's like he's describing America. For even though they knew God, I don't want you to turn there. It's Romans 1. I'd rather you just hear it. But it's a domino downward spiral. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God. Sound like us? They did not give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man. Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts. For they exchanged the truth. Look at that word again. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And for this reason, God gave them over. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind. And although they knew the ordinances of God and those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do those same things, but they give approval to those who practice them. So what you see in Romans 1 is a downward progression of what happens to any culture, not just America, what happens to any society when God gives them over. Now, let me tell you something. I, I believe with all my heart that God has not taken his hand off of his church. 
He has a covenant with his church, and we are a covenant people. With all our brokenness and with all of our issues, we're a covenant people. However, I will tell you, if you look at America, friends, I don't know who said it. It was some famous theologian one time. But this, this guy said, if, if God doesn't punish America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, if America were a test case in the Old Testament, it is, it is, I don't think it's a stretch at all for us to say that, that our culture no longer acknowledges God at all. They just push him out. So that used to look like our culture, but now, oh, so how do we get into this place where things of faith and purity and nobility and honor and things of virtue, how do they become so despised? Well, it looks like the next one. Over time, as we began, as God took his hand, I believe off of our culture for sure, I, I don't question that at all, Truth no longer dominates the culture. Things that used to be common sense, grounded, undisputable things began to now begin eroding away. To over time, it looks like the next one. Over time, truth is now on the periphery and anything goes is in the middle. And that's the culture we live in today. Anything goes. We, we, whatever you want to believe in, you can believe in. It's a free market of ideas. And I'm fine with that on the political spectrum, but I can promise and tell you this because the best ideas can win in politics. Let it go. That's a civic issue. But when it comes to morality, there are things that are absolutely true, whether you want them to be true or not. They're true, whether you want them to be true or not. And so in 2024, we live in a place now where what Stay with me. What used to be the standard is now the radical. What used to be common is now seen as fundamentalist, archaic, Neanderthal thinking. But that's the world we live in. And I'm not saying it's all bad. I'm saying we are thrust into this culture to be Jesus people in the middle of all of it. But I will tell you, the further you go, listen to me now, the further you go in your job, the further you go in society, the further you go as a Christian, you are going to be more and more marginalized. And you're going to think you're the oddball. You're going to think that you're the one, and that's, what, that's how it happens. How did our culture get to this place? Because we get leaned on and leaned on and leaned on and leaned on until we just give in. Or we just begin to accept things anymore. And I'm here to tell you, friends, the further you go in Christ and the more you hold to biblical standards, the more the world is going to tell you you're the weird one when in fact, no, you're standing in truth in a world full of compromise. It's going to look strange. That's why Peter calls us strangers and aliens. Because we look foreign to that world. And so I think you get the point. It's gonna, so, so when Peter talks about suffering, so now let's go to 1 Peter 4. When he uses this word suffering... It, I tell you what that word means. It doesn't mean that you're, don't, it's easy in your mind to think about being like beaten, harassed, put on the stake, burned at the stake, hung, head cut off, that kind of stuff. It, it, the word suffering, honestly, in the original language, simply just means harshly targeted. It just means harshly targeted, mocked, ridiculed, loss of friendships losing jobs, cancel culture, all that. Harshly targeted. So 1 Peter 4, picking it up in verse 12. He says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you. First of all, does it not feel just a little bit good to know that this has been happening for like 2,000 years? Okay, it seems new to you, right? Seems new to you, but these guys were paying for it with their life. You may pay for it with your job, but nobody's killing you yet. But that's coming. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share in the sufferings, the harsh targetings 
for Christ and of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, when Jesus comes back, you may rejoice with exultation. Be excited. Verse 14, 1 Peter 4, 14. If you are reviled, that is harassed, cast down, mocked, made shame of, if, you're, if that happens to you for the name of Christ, then you're blessed because the spirit of glory in God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer, thief, evildoer, or, tr- or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he's not to be ashamed, but it is to glorify God in his name and in this name. So let's stop there. Let's go down to verse 19, actually. Read one more. Therefore, as those who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right, we are those who suffer for what is right. So as you're harshly targeted or as you face harsh pressure for your faith, how do we respond to it, right? How do we respond to it? Because let me tell you what we don't want to be. We don't want to be that church, you know, up there just yelling, you know, at everybody because they're all just so bad, you know, just bad. We got a lot of those preachers out there, bad, 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 you know. I, I, I don't want to be that guy, and you don't want to be that person, but we do have to understand that, that truth in this kind of culture is going to really stick out. So how do we navigate it? Well, here are four truths, all right? I told you I was going to give you four truths. They all come from Peter, so we got to go ahead, too. There we go, yeah. Uh, Four truths when my faith is under fire, based on the Word of God, here's the first one. God warns me to anticipate harsh seasons. He warns me. Now, Jesus warned us often. Peter does it again, verse 12. Beloved, look at verse 12. Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you as though some strange thing were happening to you. Why why is that? Why why is it happening? You know why it's happening? Verse 14. Look in verse 14. If you want to know, if you want to know why Christians are harshly targeted, verse 14 answers it for you. If you're mocked, shamed for the name of Christ, that's the reason. We are the image bearers. It doesn't make us better than anybody else. It certainly doesn't make me some holy superhero. But I'm here to tell you, if you give your life to Christ and you lay it on the line and you walk for Christ, you are walking in God's favor. And because you're doing that, the world hates that example. And it comes from the devil himself. We are targeted, Christians for 2,000 years have been targeted, not because the world just hates Christians because they're easy to hate. No, we bear the name. We wear the brand. We wear the brand, right? A lot of you love college football. You go to an away game, and you got enough courage to wear your school at an away game. Don't complain. (laughs) <laughs> don't complain. Yeah, you know, I saw a guy one time at a UT game, and I kind of admired this dude. This was like 20-something years ago. Homeboy walks up into the stands. It was an Arkansas game, and he had on one of those pig hats. <laughs> Buddy. I mean, he just lowered his head. I'm like, well, you wore it. I mean, you knew what was going to happen to you, right? Thankfully, nobody threw anything at him, but, I mean, it... Just his mere appearance changed the vibe, right? We wear the brand, and you're going to stand out as abnormal. And I want to say something to all of you. As you wear the name of Christ, listen to me close, you're going to feel like you're the one at fault. You're going to be made to feel when you stand up for biblical values that you're the one that's less than educated. You're going to feel like you're the one that's in the wrong. And I'm here to tell you, friends, the further we go in a Romans 1 society, the more that truth will look like carnival thinking. It will look like Neanderthal, out of date 
I can't believe you would fall for that type of stuff. So just remember, God warns me to anticipate that. Here's a second truth. God wants me to use targeting as a pathway for testifying. What, is, what does Peter say? Now, you can, if you want to turn there, you can. But in verse five, chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, he says, Be of sober spirit, be on alert. Verse, chapter 5, verse 8, Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him, being firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brothers who are in the world. You realize you're not alone. All across the globe, this has been happening. It's martyrdom's never stopped. Christian harassment's never stopped. It's it's all across the world. It's not just us. Our brothers and sisters across the world face harassment for their faith, right? They face harassment for their faith. But he says in verse 10, After you have suffered for a little while, the God of grace who called you to eternal glory will strengthen and establish you. This is why when you're going through some type of targeting for your faith in the classroom or in the boardroom, on Facebook, I don't care what it is, when you're going through any type of harassment for your faith, let me tell you what not to do. Don't just endure it. Don't just like plant your feet, get ready, and just wait it out. No, this is happening to you to give you a chance to testify about the grace of God and the goodness of God. This is why you see people like the Apostle Paul say things like, I count it an honor to be able to suffer in Jesus' name. Why? Because they saw suffering as a chance to tell the world why. And you got to love a guy like Peter. I mean, this is a guy who denied Jesus in front of everybody. And then once he saw Jesus come out of the grave, you got to see the change in Peter to stand up in front of a whole bunch of thousands of Jews and say, you killed him. You killed him. He came to you, the only Messiah you're ever going to get, and you killed him. I mean, that guy went from coward to courageous post-resurrection. Why? He understood that this was the one true Messiah, so use it. Harsh seasons, God gives you a pathway. And I'm telling you, as time goes on, that's what God's going to expect from us, is when we're hauled in front of the courtrooms, so to speak, that we do not deny the very God that saved us. Number three, here's another truth when you go through targeting for your faith. God promises special favor in harsh seasons. He promises special favor in harsh seasons. The beauty of going through a book study is you can kind of get a feel for it. I want you to look in 1 Peter 2.20. What a great verse. 1 Peter 2.20. For what credit is there when you sin and harshly treat it, that you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and you suffer for it, patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. Look at the verse up there. If when you do what is right and you suffer for it, this finds favor with God. You know what that means? When you break that word down in the original language, you know what favor means? Special grace. Special grace. It's a word, it's it's the word charis. It's the word, we get special grace from God. When you're going through a, a harsh time, understand. I don't know how it happens, but I have seen it even in my own life. Seriously, listen to me. I've seen it in my own life. Times when I have taken stands biblically, even when people don't understand, you just, there's something that God gives you. And a lot of times it's just stamina to stand up under it. I'm telling you, it's the truth. Peter testifies. We get special favor with God. So, And here's what I love about this idea of being targeted for our faith. And I hope this encourages you as much as it does me. One of the things that this tells me, this verse right here, is that harsh treatment for your faith, it happens inside the arena of grace. You with me on that? It happens inside the arena of grace. You're not outside the grace of God when you go through targeting. You're actually, when you're targeted, you're, it happens inside the bubble of grace. And we, we get favor with God from that. Here's one more truth I want to give you today about when your faith is targeted is that God promises that harsh seasons won't last forever. Aren't you glad? Whew. Hey, but it may not be a week. It could be a lifetime. So don't get too happy too quick. Right? Harsh seasons, they don't last forever. And I love how Peter tells us this 
in chapter 5. I put it on the screen for you. In his kindness, God calls you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus, 1 Peter 5.10. So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you, and he will place you on a firm foundation. That's an eternal perspective. It's an eternal perspective. It won't last forever. I want to I keep something in front of you. You've heard me say this before. For many of you that have been at Clearview for a long time, you'll have remembered me saying it. But this is the most traveling church I've ever seen in my life. Okay, as evidence right now, people are still gone for Memorial Day, and that was just days ago. I mean, you know, I tell other pastor friends of mine, like, you know, your people, when they get spring break, they just go to the lake. My people go to, like, Thailand, <laughs> Tibet, you know, because that's awesome. Do it, man. Have at it. It's great. You may have recalled me saying this, but I'm going to say it to you again. I want you to remember that who... Who we are called to serve. On the day that you die, on the day that you die, let me tell you who is not going to be in the Bema seat of Revelation calls, the Bema seat of judgment. It's not going to be your social media followers. All your peeps on social media are not going to be in the Bema seat. Your CEO is not going to be in the Bema seat. You're going right? The governor's not going to be in the Bema seat. The president's not going to be in the Bema seat. Your bestie is not going to, your best friend's not going to be in the Bema seat. Celebrities that tell you how the world should work are not going to be in the Bema seat. Fashion designers are not going to tell you how to live on that day. No, on the day that you die, pop culture icons, cultural leaders, political leaders, rock stars, celebrities, none of those people are going to be in the Bema seat staring down at you. There is going to be one. And his name is Holy God. And the reason I bring that up to you, friends, is not to scare you because you don't have to fear that day. But what I would say to you is that you need to live today to please the person you're going to stand in front of on that day. Live today according to the guidelines and the accountability and the standards and the expectations of the one that can actually determine where you spend eternity. And I'm going to tell you that it's hard to remember when all of your friends are telling you in the 10th grade that you're the weird one. It's hard for you when you're a junior in college and all the girls are saying to you, you mean you're not having sex with your boyfriend? What is wrong with you? It's hard to remember that you're the one in the right. It's hard to remember in the one-on-one -on -one sales consultation behind closed doors when they're asking you to fudge the numbers. It's hard to remember that your CEO, your VP of sales is not going to be the one in the Bema seat because there's actual pressure. And I'm here to tell you, I know that pressure is real. I know it's real. Don't hear me say it's not real, but what I am saying to you, friends, is look at this verse. In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory. So after you suffered for a little while, it is, don't misunderstand, heaven's great, but we are going to suffer. And I'm going to go so far as to say, if you're not getting pressure for your faith, you're probably not living it. You're probably not living it loud enough. Your standards need to be getting pushback. We are called to execute into this world a real and living faith. We are strangers and we are aliens, but there's a better day coming. Amen?
You know, it means a lot to us that you would come here today and be a part of who we are. It, it really does matter to us more than you might realize. Sometimes I think we underestimate the power we have to influence people. You know, if you would look around your world, you'd be amazed at how many people would receive what you have to say to them. You could be a digital missionary. You don't have to post everything on Facebook or we're not asking you to go on your favorite social platform, but I would challenge you to look around your world. I guarantee you might have a friend, even in a different state or another part of the world, something was said today, whether a sermon, a prayer, a song, something was said that could mean a lot to them, man, send it to them. You'd be amazed at how much of a difference that could make.